webinar, Our Future Investment in the Sustainable Built Environment. I'm Sally Hadley, a consultant within the Environment team in the UK, and I'm joined today by Katrina Brady, the Director of Strategy and Development at the World Green Building Council. We are going to present for around 30 minutes and then open the floor to any questions you may have. If you would like to drop any questions in the chat box as we go through, we will do our best to answer these. The slides will be available from the handout box in the control panel. We will also be recording this, which will be available from our website. As we are joined by Will GBC today, I thought I'd provide a quick introduction to Will GBC for those who may not be aware. Will GBC is a global network that works with businesses, organizations, and governments to accelerate sustainability and decarbonization in the building and construction sectors. WSP was appointed by Will GBC as consultant for a new flagship report, Beyond the Business Case, Why You Can't Afford to Invest in the Sustainable Built Environment. The report was launched at COP26 in Glasgow during the day dedicated to cities, regions and the built environment. We worked with Will GBC to help shape the report, provide technical input and gather evidence to support the business case by demonstrating how it changes in high carbon or low carbon, healthy or unhealthy world. During this webinar, we will discuss the business case, followed by how our global future, considering how climate change affects this business case, and then I will present a WSP case study about access to green finance. I'm now going to hand over to Katrina, who is going to discuss the financial and social value business case. Thank you so much, Sally, and good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening depending where you are in the world. Thank you very much to WSP for having me today. So my name is Katrina Brady. I'm Director of Strategy and Development at the World Green Building Council. And it is my absolute pleasure to be talking to you about our Beyond the Business Case report today. Let's see if my slides want to move. Nope, a bit stuck, Sally. If you could pop it onto the next one, that would be great. Hopefully the functionality will arrive. So just to echo what Sally said a few seconds ago, the World GBC is a global action network comprised of around 70 green building councils around the world. So we are essentially a network of networks representing a collective membership of around 36,000 organisations. Our strategy is aligned with the targets of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as you'll see down the left hand side of my slide, and focused around three core areas of sustainability, climate action, health and well-being and resources and the circular economy. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the urgency of our situation is this. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these statistics, but for those of you who uh, need a bit of an overview of the situation with the built environment, not wanting to start off on too negative a foot, but the impact that our built environment has on sustainability challenges and global climate change is hugely significant. As you can see, the urban built environment alone is responsible for three quarters of our annual greenhouse gas emissions, with buildings alone accounting for 37%, according to last year's International Energy Agency and Global ABC status report. Cities represent 80% of our global GDP, and I'm sure we're all aware of the increasing urbanization of the global population, with the proportion of people who live in cities expected to increase to 70% by 2050. A statistic that always really um, brings this to life to me, for me is the recognition of quite how much space that's going to take, quite how many new buildings need to be constructed. And there's an expectation that this city, a city the size of Paris, will be constructed every week for the next 40 years. So, of course, the environmental impact in terms of emissions, the impact in terms of the material use, the social impact, the use of utilities and resources like water, the impact on our air will be astounding. Additionally, it's not just about buildings. We've got to think about infrastructure as well. And it's forecast that 75 percent of the infrastructure that's needed by 2050 for us to reach our sustainable development goals still needs to be built. So clearly there is a huge amount to do, but that also presents a huge opportunity for us to develop all of these new assets in a sustainable way. 
So on to the next slide, please. And I can present to you the World Green Building Council's Beyond the Business Case report, which was launched at COP26 last year in Glasgow, my hometown of Glasgow. Um, and today I will take you through the report and some of the key highlights. And we'll also make sure to share the link to the full report and the executive summary in the chat box so that you can access it online. There's a very exciting animated version online, but there's also a static version that you can download and print out on FSC paper and refer back to at any point. So a small word of background on why we undertook this report. First of all, um, the Beyond the Business Case report actually builds on the World GBC's previous business case report, which we published in 2013. And going into last year, as of course all eyes were on COP26, even from January the 1st, we recognised the fact that obviously the conversation was going to turn to the business case and we needed meaningful work that pointed to the trends of today. And we needed to be able to talk about relevant policy changes, the rise of sustainability engagement in the private sector, of course, notably ESG, when we were having these conversations on this very important stage. I think also in comparison to 2013, we wanted to capture the rise in social value. And it was really important to all of us on the task force who co-developed it with us to demonstrate that the value proposition for sustainable buildings and infrastructure assets needs to be ethical as well as purely financial. Next slide, please. So I just mentioned the development task force and Sally very kindly introduced the fact that we were delighted to work with WSP on the future scenario modelling. We'll hear a wee bit more about that later on, but you can see on screen the fantastic group of green building councils from around the network and private sector organisations and NGOs who helped support us in co-developing and launching this report all the way through last year and in the run up to COP. So diving into the content of the report now, seven irrefutable co-benefits for investing in a sustainable built environment are demonstrated consistently across the financial and social value case. And when we were uh, determining the research for this report, it was clear that these themes were coming up over and over again in case studies and theoretical evidence in the current and the future value propositions. And those were social benefits to the occupants, um, reading around this clockwise, through health, productivity and well-being. Lower or equivalent costs at operational phase, but also at supply chain and construction phase as well. Risk mitigation in terms of resilience to the inevitable impacts of climate change that we're all facing. Uh, as well as future proofing against uh, legis legislative changes or corporate expectations, reputational risk, topics we'll dive into shortly. Looking at the bottom, six o'clock on my wheel, uh, we saw a huge amount of evidence that there are higher asset values for sustainable buildings linked both to performance and asset desirability. That links to investment opportunities through the rapidly transitioning finance sector, supporting share prices and increasing requirements on ESG reporting, access to finance, and of course, the wider role of business. The organisations need to recognise their responsibility to engage with sustainable development, which includes environmental and social action, and commit to conversations that are broader than just profit margins. So on the next slide, thank you. There is a quick excerpt from the report, a key fact about the context, highlighting the fact that yes, there are a multitude of economic imperatives and opportunities for investing, developing, designing, constructing, or occupying sustainable buildings or infrastructure assets. And we'll talk about those in the next few minutes. And I'll really look forward to hearing from many of you who were listening in today to hear your experiences or any of the questions but the point that we wanted to make and that we felt was reflected by the organisations on our task force was that the value proposition was broadening and increasing in prominence today in comparison to the conversation that we were having about 10 years ago. So the report places the business case in the context of the barriers that exist globally and also were analysed by region. So you can see on this multicolored map slide that these vary all the way from financial barriers to lack of awareness or market demand 
through to political support and incentives. And we tried to address all of these barriers at a high level throughout the content of the report. So on the next slide is an illustration of that broadening context of what we cover as we present this broader business case for sustainable built assets. We covered drivers for the financial business case. So things like policy change, um, the rise in sustainable finance, the growth of ESG, plus the reasons why green buildings and assets create this good financial opportunity, what we term the business case. Everything from greater access to investment, corporate reputation, lower build costs, to return on investment through productivity. But I think for me, more exciting is and more unique and innovative is the fact that the report gives equal weighting for the first time to social value. And as we worked last year as a task force, it was clear that this was a topic that was not only close to everyone's heart, but people recognised it was incredibly important for us to really try and elevate this topic within the industry on the platform of the stage as important as COP26. So we presented the contextual factors driving the rise in social value from the COVID-19 pandemic to private and public factors like policy or procurement, and then outlined the social value case at three stages of action. The final section is about the future value proposition, which Sally will tell us about in a wee bit of time. So thank you. Let's dive into the drivers first. I wanted to pull out uh, ESG reporting, first of all, because it's incredibly topical right now. I'm sure it's a topic that many of the people joining us today live or listening in are grappling with or thinking about. I think May is the World ESG Summit as well. So there are obviously are a lot of very timely conversations going on about this. So we recognise that the rise in sustainable finance and specifically the growth of ESG requirements is another big focus for organisations and perhaps is their pathway for taking this journey to sustainability. And we are working to emphasise the opportunity of ESG within the market and calling for more ambition to be placed around the built environment. And within the report, we dive into specific ways in which ESG reporting is creating a business case for sustainable built assets, everything from changing market trends to shareholder expectations, the popularity of ESG and the impact on the new generation of consumers. In terms of other drivers of the business case, we highlighted three key trends which we think are transforming the business case for sustainable development and something that we need to be aware of. As our socioeconomic and political context is changing, the justification that one might have for their building not being net zero might be very different now than in five or 10 years time in the same way that today is a different conversation than we were having 10 years ago. So we've highlighted the change in this context in terms of policy change, looking both nationally from, for example, that uh, as I'm sure many of you know, the countries who have ratified the Paris Agreement are legally obliged to submit a nationally determined contribution or an NDC, which is stating the contribution to climate change mitigation that they will make as part of their contribution to the Paris Agreement 1.5 degree Celsius warming aims. And as of 2021, 136 countries were mentioning buildings in their NDCs. So in terms of the message that shows us, if we have um, the, the majority proportion of the countries of the world talking about the built environment as an area where they're making public commitment to the fact that they will reduce the emissions coming from the built environment, then naturally we can expect that policy change at a national level certainly will reflect that. At a city level, I think cities really where a lot of advocacy work can be more exciting because there's obviously opportunity to change policy at a much faster scale than at national level, but there are more than a thousand cities to date who are now committed to reach net zero by 2050. As part of that, they've committed to halving emissions by 2030. So they are well on their way on the sustainability journey. So the message there really is that the global real estate market should expect increasing regulatory enforcement to enhance these or to advance rather these sectoral mitigation goals that align with the trajectory of the NDCs as they're rolled out around the world. 
A couple of other points are around incoming finance regulations, such as carbon pricing, which we highlighted um, trends of carbon pricing rising around the world, the trajectory that we can expect to strengthen in the current decades, and of course, the rise of sustainable finance and ESG reporting, which I was just talking about um, previously. But we know that currently more than half of global asset owners are currently implementing ESG considerations in their investment strategies, and that it's expected that ESG funds will represent the majority of proportions of mutual fund assets by 2025. So the trend for sustainability, not just at regulatory level, but at financial level, is clearly there. The, the warning signs are there for organisations who are not engaging with sustainability, that there is going to be pressure coming really in all directions. A specific word on regulatory change. Um, we go into a lot of detail in this report about the EU taxonomy, which is very prevalent here in Europe. I know worldwide it's considered a fantastic innovation in terms of sustainability policy change. And at World GBC, we've been delighted to be contributing to the platform uh, on sustainable finance and helping to come up with some of the indicators within the driving group for the uh, circular economy criteria within the EU taxonomy. And one of the other things we've recognised is that across all geographies, there's been a really strong interest in the potential regulatory impact on a broader scale, not only for organisations who offer um, economic products and services that want to trade on a global market, but also the precedent that the EU taxonomy is setting worldwide in terms of this innovation in sustainability policy. So that takes me into the business case on the next slide, please. And I have just listed these in bullet points to stop me talking about this all afternoon. But I would really advise you to dive into the report if you're interested in exploring any of these points, because there's a huge amount of evidence that underpins all the statements that I'm about to make to you just now. But the research that we conducted, that we worked with WSP and so many experts on, highlighted the fact that sustainable buildings and assets create a financial business case because of the greater access to investment. For example, the fact that green buildings are now considered to be one of the most important asset classes in the green bond market uh, because of ESG and corporate reputation. And I love the statistic actually that over 40 of the biggest global institutional investing firms have indicated that ESG was universally top, top of mind and that there are a lot of investors who are saying that they will soon be limiting allocations exclusively to investment managers who take a formalized approach to sustainable investing and those are really fantastic market signposts. Next, higher asset value and desirability that sustainable buildings do tend to have higher asset values than conventional buildings, um, both higher rental value but also lower operating costs and that's often reflected in higher occupancy rates as well. And studies do predict a doubling in global demand for green buildings worldwide in the near future. Next, on to resilience, um, a really relevant topic for us at the moment, um, and highlighting the fact that sustainability is also sensible from a risk mitigation perspective, that stranded assets present a huge risk to investment owners and developers for both existing buildings and infrastructure assets, plus those under construction now. And the potential impact of climate change related effects alone is risking a value for residential real estate assets alone of some of $16 trillion and another $5 trillion for commercial assets. So the financial repercussions of the physical impacts of climate change are ginormous. So sustainability from a resilience perspective does present a really strong value proposition there as well. Additionally, I touched on it briefly before, but obviously a more energy efficient building will present lower operational costs. There are great studies that show how this um, demonstrates a faster return on investment uh, with operating costs for sustainable assets considered 13% lower for a new construction and close to 9% for retrofitted building projects. Similarly, a same trend at construction phase from reduced build costs through circularity opportunities. 
um, again reflected in preferential insurance premiums and finally better occupant productivity in the commercial sector which is a trend I'm sure many of us have been aware of now for close to a decade the fact that sustainable health focused design interventions can stimulate better occupant health and comfort and consequently improve productivity. So those are the points, thank you Sally, that are highlighted from a financial perspective in this report and I, I do stress that there is a lot more information than what, what I've crammed into a few sentences to go and check out but on the other side of the value proposition is the social side of sustainability and I really can't stress how exciting and important it was for us to be presenting social value creation as a unique but equally important part of the value proposition for sustainable buildings. To define this, uh, I'll show you here the UK Green Building Council's definition of social value. For those who aren't familiar with the phrase, social value is created when buildings, places and infrastructure support environmental, economic and social well-being and in doing so improve the quality of life of people. So, for example, that might be the provision of jobs, the creation of safe, healthy places, the inclusion of nature that reduces the urban heat island effect, a whole range of different opportunities can be captured within the umbrella of social value. So on the next slide, we go through at a very high level the drivers of the social value case. Um, this really is looking at the context of why we've written a report which in many ways could be, could be considered purely financial, but we're talking about social value. And we feel that the drivers that have triggered the increasing prominence of the topic of social value, equity, social justice, especially in more developed geographies around the world, include the impact of COVID-19, the dramatic increase that I'm sure we're all aware of, and awareness of not just social value, but sustainability, health and equity. And it's becoming increasingly clear, I think, that the world can no longer justify tackling issues indirectly and individually and that we must be taking this more collective approach to addressing total impact on people's quality of life and that's something that the way that our lives have been impacted over the last two and a half years I think has really helped to normalize that opinion. On a totally different footing there's of course increased awareness from the private sector, the rise of corporate social responsibility, social values increasing in the private sector as a metric that is being measured, that's being included in projects. We're seeing that the majority of organisations are publishing CSR and ESG reports. Um, it was 90% of companies on the S&P 500 index in 2019 in comparison to 20% in 2011. So as well as awareness of the environmental side of sustainability, that's naturally having ramifications on the social side as well. And finally, public drivers, including policy and procurement. And this is particularly prevalent when we're talking about social infrastructure. And ultimately, we are aware of the fact that public procurement tenders are driven by government, are driven by ministries. And so organizations who want to be involved in these public procurement processes should see, so, should see enhancing social value as an opportunity to enhance their competitiveness in that tendering process. Thank you. So on this next slide, you can see a very lovely map graphic, I hope, of some recent trends from the World Green Building Trends 2021 survey data. And this is about social drivers of green buildings. And we, I think one of the reasons I really like pulling this out is I think it shows that social factors overall are actually an incredibly powerful and I think under exploited reason that people are interested in sustainability, that people are interested and engaged in the green building movement and you can see on this map on this graphic that these social factors overall are most powerful in the global south especially in africa so in terms of the engagement strategy for a wider market engagement on sustainability in the built environment i think we need to be conscious of how we're communicating the social and environmental co-benefits of sustainable buildings and that's particularly relevant as we're all already starting to think about COP27 taking place in Egypt later this year. So just to run through the social value case super quickly, 
there are three scales in which we want to highlight that social value can be created or enhanced and those go from health and well-being at building or individual asset scale um, considering the fact that I'm sure we have heard the stat that people spend an average of 90% of their time inside buildings and that takes us back to the opportunity to improve the health and well-being of building occupants, users or people who operate around the vicinity of a building or asset. Secondly, community benefit. And the social value case for the real estate sector, I think more generally, is the benefit that even individual developments can bring to people in the broader community. Um, this could be manifested as increased jobs, community health and benefit, resilient infrastructure, the protection of biodiversity. There are so many ways in which a project can provide community benefit or potentially impact the community in a negative way, can create that positive or negative multiplier effect. And there are some statistics have suggested that a shift to a greener economy could create 24 million new jobs if the right policies are put in place. Obviously, that's a very grand aim, but for everybody involved in any kind of project, it's a really exciting opportunity, I think, to consider the implementation of social value at community benefit, even if we can't necessarily guarantee the ways in which a, a building or asset will be used when it's operational or its larger environmental in, um, impacts. Finally, an area that I'm personally really interested in learning more about is around transforming the supply chain and construction. And that includes these topics of worker welfare, human rights and justice, uh, the fact that we know that actually around 7% of the global workforce is directly employed by the construction sector. And unfortunately, because of the very traditional and also huge levels of subcontracting that happen within these very intense and complicated supply chains within the material and construction industry, there is still a huge amount of forced labour, human trafficking, modern slavery that occur across many industries of the world. And unfortunately, we do know that the material industry, the heavy material industry, and in many cases, the construction industry is an area most at risk of these human right violations. So I think the a trend that we can expect to see in recent years is that organisations are increasingly aware of this. And so we'll be looking at having greater transparency in the supply chain and much greater awareness of this opportunity and responsibility to be catering for social value at all three of these scales. The final point of that is just about the measurement of social value that on the next slide, we just have a brief sentence about the fact that measurement of social value is rapidly evolving as well as awareness. If you can pop onto the next slide, thank you, perfect. And one of the outcomes that we highlighted in the report was that we believe that there will soon be a reflection of the increased ability to quantify social value that will be reflected in the financial value of an asset. And this will catalyze market momentum and demand towards built assets that advance social value across the supply chain. So to say that in a more simple way, people are figuring out how to measure social value. There are loads of fantastic tools. It's increasingly becoming enshrined in public policy, particularly here in the UK. And soon it's going to be a factor of demand, a factor of value proposition if your development is enhancing community benefit, protecting the occupants, and you can prove that you have done your best to protect human health, well-being, and human rights across the supply chain. So to conclude for now at World GVC, we're calling for deep, unprecedented collaboration, multi-stakeholder action, all the buzzwords, all the jargon across the entire value chain, and the Really, the, the number one sentence I use to describe this report is that it highlights why you cannot afford not to invest in sustainability. The time has passed for us to be showing people the carrots, the incentives. We've got to get the sticks out now. We've got to demonstrate why the time has come for everybody to be engaging in sustainability for all of the reasons that I run through now and that you can explore on the report by following the link on screen. So I hope you will enjoy reviewing this. There's also an executive summary available on the website if you'd like to look at a shorter version. And if you have any immediate concerns, feel free to reach out to me with any questions, but I will look forward to 
answering a few of your questions in a few minutes time. Over to you, Sally, thank you. Thank you, Katina, that was really interesting. So from our perspective, in terms of future scenario modeling, it's really important to consider the business case in the future across the lifespan of development for different building types and for different climates. So I'm now going to move on to discuss the future business case for the sustainable built environment. I'll focus on our future scenario modeling for climate change and how we anticipate this to impact the business case. It's clear that we will be affected by climate change. If that isn't now, it will definitely be in the future. So how will climate change affect the business case? As mentioned, we've carried out research and analysis for the business case, much of it based on our future scenario modeling workshops with stakeholders and industry experts, such as architects, green building organizations, engineers, and manufacturers. We envisaged a wide range of scenarios to gain their views on how they, this would impact on buildings. The feedback helped to build the value proposition for the sustainable built environment. Our methodology for the modeling of future scenarios included sources such as the IPCC projections and the IEA perspectives. So as you can see on the slide, I've included three, the three scenarios. That's the best, the medium and the worst. Generally, these follow the projections, pathways and perspectives as indicated on the slides. So if we look at the best scenario, broadly, we anticipate that we will, there will be a global transition to zero carbon world with climate change a priority for decision making and collaboration between governments impacting all sectors. Mitigation is stringent, planetary health and ecosystems are conserved and regenerated. The requirement for building adaptation is lower and society addresses the sustainable development goals, reducing global inequalities, and there will be a noticeable behavioural change to focus on climate change and the environment. Whereas if we look at the worst case scenario, it's based on there being a global focus on adapting to climate change without compromising on economic growth or current lifestyles. There will be a limited climate change policy or technical advances to shift from carbon intensive industries or improve energy efficiency so high carbon emissions remain. The environmental effects of climate change will be evident globally of catastrophic impacts on vulnerable populations and complete ecosystem degradation. Although there will be a shift from the business as usual approach, factoring in commitments to limit emissions and improve energy efficiency, but with no meaningful climate policy. The medium scenario is somewhere in the middle and includes a gradual decarbonisation of society to renewable energy and carbon neutrality. However, the effects of climate change disproportionately will result in irreversible environmental harm and costs resulting in increased global inequalities. The assessment assumes a base scenario where climate action broadly follows the two degree trajectory, the medium scenario. We then fed our findings into the seven key themes which Katrina previously discussed. From the baseline scenario, we calculated to what extent the business case would change depending on whether the world successfully reduces greenhouse gases in line with the best scenario, or whether we end up with a worst case scenario of three degrees. Our findings indicate that the business case for sustainable buildings is clear, even in a high carbon, low regulated world. So let's look at, look at some examples from three of the business case themes. If we look at occupant benefit to the left of your screen, if operating in a three degree world, the business case is high, meaning that extreme weather is likely to reduce building performance and therefore lead to suboptimal environment. Whereas in a 1.5 degree world, the business case is low to medium, because although the extreme weather in some regions may occur, the impact on building operations is lower and therefore conditions remain for the majority optimal. Alternatively, if we consider the extent to which climate change impacts operating costs in the middle of your screen, the business case is low to medium in a three degree scenario as demand for carbon intensive fuel increases for cooling and therefore so does the price, which means energy efficient and passive buildings are cheaper to run. Whereas in a 1.5 degree world, adoption of energy efficiencies and low carbon technologies in buildings increases despite the reduced impacts of climate change, so the business case is high. Finally, from a risk perspective, the business case is strong in a three degree world 
since buildings must be able to resist the impacts of climate extremes. And it is medium in a 1.5 degree world because the impacts of buildings due to climate change may still occur. I'm now going to move on to look at a WSP project, which highlights some of the business case arguments for the sustainable built environment. Okay, m and investments have a fund available to privately owned businesses working to create a more sustainable world, which includes housing as one of the largest proportions of individual carbon and footprint in the UK. We have recently supported Green Core Construction to secure 500 million pounds of investment from m and so just a brief introduction to Greencore. Greencore provides a solution to making ultra sustainable climate positive homes, which lock up more carbon than they emit over their lifetime. They have developed an innovative modern method of construction, which uses a closed panel timber frame manufactured off site and insulated with natural materials such as hemp, lime and wood fibre. The homes are extremely energy efficient to use with triple glazing, solar panels and excellent insulation all of which helps occupiers manage their energy bills. The cost for these homes is comparable to the similar size traditional houses, but the way I have a higher, higher performance and can be built quickly with a superstructure house built in less than two weeks. For Green Core to scale up their operations nationwide to help alleviate the national housing shortage in the UK and to deliver for large institutional clients, they required investment. We have carried out an independent technical assessment of Greencore's product. This included a whole life cycle carbon assessment and an analysis for energy form performance of a typical Greencore house, as can be seen on the image there. Our results showed a substantial reduction of, of 350% less carbon emitted compared to traditionally built homes, and that Greencore homes are actually net carbon negative in both construction and operation, which no traditionally ho built home can deliver. Greater access to finance was available to Green Core Construction as a company because they built sustainable housing. Okay, so thank you for listening. And to conclude, I've got a couple of summary points. During this webinar, we have discussed why you can't afford not to invest in the sustainable built environment. Katrina has explained the need for the green built environment and the ways to identify value. She has importantly outlined the financial business case and the drivers for social value. I have explained the future scenario modelling for climate change and the anticipated implications for the business case. Clarity has been provided around the difference between a 1.5 degree world and a 3 degree world. Importantly, we have discussed that there is a business case in all climate scenarios for investment in the built environment. At WSP, our responsibility is to see the future more clearly, advise our clients and design to that future. We must ensure that as an industry, we have the skills to design to these future climate scenarios. The business case not only goes into the heart of our future ready thinking at WSP, but also endorses the significant investment clients are now making to decarbonize their assets and build in resilience for the future. Thank you again for listening and we'll now move on to any questions. As previously mentioned, uh, if you'd like to drop any questions into the chat box, then we can have a look at these. Okay, lots of them coming through. Katrina, do you want to have a look at the first one? Um, so I'll just read that one out for you. Where should we focus sure, our efforts? Where should we focus our efforts over the next five years as investors and asset managers? Okay, a great question. Thank you, Sally, and thank you to whoever submitted that question. Um, I think it's very difficult to give a one word answer to this, and I expect that's the reason why it needs to be asked as a question, because there there is such complexity in the world of sustainability that I think it's very hard for organisations who are grappling with first steps to to make a direction. The first thing I would encourage organizations who are trying to figure out their short to medium term strategy to do would be to try to understand the whole playing field 
of what people are talking about when they're talking about sustainable development in the real estate sector. So there's probably no better first place to go to than the UN Sustainable Development Goals, because although it's 17 areas of sustainability, which sounds like an awful lot, it does highlight the interrelationship between the environmental elements of sustainability, the social, the economic. And so you can do a bit of an analysis to see what areas you're you have a material impact on as a business in terms of your own internal operations and in terms of what you produce or supply or sell, whatever whatever your service line is. I think there's also an important reflection to be done in terms of the geography that you're working in and the scale of action you can possibly provide. If you are an investor or developer who is working on, for example, residential projects in Europe, then I would say retrofit has got to be where you're focusing your attention. That's a huge crisis point, the fact we've got to address the housing stock that already exists. We're not going to be building new homes. We've got to make sure that the ones we already have are energy efficient. But if you are a global property developer and you're focusing your efforts on areas of population growth in the global south, then it's more of a conversation about new build and learning lessons from around the world. So I think there is a piece around education and awareness of all the different areas that we can provide benefit. The challenges of trade-offs that sometimes need to be done the the fact that we obviously want every building to be totally circular totally healthy net zero and to be resilient and be able to adapt to chi and changing climate but sometimes we do need to compromise on achieving all of those sustainability goals at once but i think annoying as it is is an answer a flexible approach is important to try and tackle the most immediately relevant sustainability challenges for the area in which your project or investment is focused on. And that hopefully is something that can be shared with, with the wider world so that we can be learning from the lessons, the, the mistakes and the best practice that's happening out there already. Great answer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think just reading in the chat box there, I think it builds on um, a question which we've also got is, um, do we ensure that the drive to deliver more sustainable buildings doesn't result in extensive demolition and new build rather than refurbishment, which has a significant lower impact. I think that's something that you've absolutely touched on there. Absolutely. Um, Do you want, should we talk about that a little more? Is there anything you want to add yeah. on the retrofit conversation, Sally? I think absolutely you have to look at retrofit first and especially um, if you compare say the UK housing um, comparative to maybe um, newer developments within the south um, we can't just be thinking about circular economy and things like that and we can't just be dem demolishing buildings that are perfectly fit for use but could do with some refurbishment to repurpose them and I think that is should be a focus for us. Absolutely and I always love that phrase that you hear people saying that the most sustainable building is the one that already exists. I think that's something that we we have to remember even when we're looking and talking about case studies of really exciting new design construction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to move on to the next question, another one for you, Katrina. Do you know what is what is the added value for investors once the building is green? Sure, um, I think this is a number that it would be magical if we had a, a solid, yes, guaranteed 25% um, added premium on cost for you as an investor or seller or owner occupier. Um, as you would expect, there's not one round number, but studies that we um, looked at and that are published in the Beyond the Business Case report highlight that here in London, um, a BREAM certified building commands a market premium of 6 to 11 percent. And the World Green Building Trends report in 2021, I can't remember what the exact number was, but they highlighted again that on a global scale, there was an expectation that green buildings commanded a significant premium of a similar kind of ballpark. So I think um, it's it's um, it's difficult to put a stamp on the on the word or on the number that of the improved value of the asset in terms of sale or rental premium. But I think it's also important to consider those non-financial value propositions as well. The fact that the lifespan of buildings that are being developed or, or leased now, or even buildings that are operational now, are going to be probably still standing in the next few decades and still operational when we're starting to face more extreme weather events, when we're starting to realise the impacts of climate change, when there's going to be increasing pressure on buildings to be adaptable as we're changing our norms of work patterns and transport and 
um, and everything like that. So uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up there, I suppose. But I guess the overall number, the overall number is very difficult to quantify, but it's important to keep the perspective of the broader value proposition that's financial and ethical as well, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just take take a stab at this next one. Um, what are the levers that we as consultants can use to help our clients make the right decision in challenging contexts? And I think Katrina has uh, just um, touched on this as well across multiple different angles. Um, I think it's very dependent on the context, um, depending on what, what is the type of challenge that you're facing. Is your, is your developer facing climate risk or is it that there is policy pressure and legislation? And I think you've got to consider the levers from multiple different angles and what is the, the primary concern. Alternatively, it could be that they're driven by social value and ESG and they need to really consider the ethical considerations of a development. So I don't think there's one straight answer for this one either. Um, I think you've got to consider multiple different things and weigh it all up. And if you can, combine them all together. Um, OK, I think we've got time for one more. Um, just having a look through the chat. Should we go for um, who or what are the biggest barriers for more widespread adoption of policies outlined in the report? OK, I can have a go at answering that one. Um, <laughs> barriers for adopting policies outlined in the report. I think the barrier probably is the creation of the policies to be adopted, to be totally honest with you. Um, although, I mean, I did spend a wee bit of time talking about the EU taxonomy and how incredibly exciting and innovative that is in terms of global regulation. That The reason that's so exciting and innovative is that it's very far away from standard practice. It's not the type of sustainability regulation that we're seeing all over the world today. So the vast majority of us are living or operating in parts of the world where sustainability or sustainability is not as embedded within built environment policies, building codes as we as sustainability professionals would like them to be. So I think the barrier itself is the ambition level of policy, but I think the way to tackle that barrier is to go beyond policy. And I think policy works. I think there's, I think there's two conversations to have about policy. I mean, although obviously we know that NDCs are going to be increasing pressure, we know that cities are um, making net zero targets and policy changes will come in, they will probably happen slower than the pace we need to, to be noticing real transition to net, 30, uh, to net zero by 2030 rather. So although we can expect them coming in certainly within the lifespan of a building, so there is a risk mitigation perspective to consider for building owners now who are operating buildings that are far away from that trajectory. But if you are looking to genuinely be a leader and genuinely try to benefit from the value proposition of sustainable buildings in all the different ways we've talked about, then I think the answer is to be going beyond policy, beyond what's being asked for today and looking at all these different areas of sustainability, as Sally said, looking at the areas in which your project can genuinely make a difference. And that's where I think we can receive this additional non-financial benefit of the, the ethical benefits of sustainable building, the financial benefits, the longer term benefits, the reduced risk of stranded asset, the risk mitigation, uh, the corporate reputation, all of these kind of softer bits that are harder to quantify. But in terms of doing the right thing and being rewarded for it in a commercial organization i think that the value is is certainly there yeah absolutely and i think as professionals together we all have an opportunity to really lead and pioneer an approach to ad adopt all of these different angles to combine them all together and go beyond policy so i think we'll wrap up there thank you all so much for your questions and thank you for listening we will go through the questions separately and we will address them and get back to you um, so yeah thank you so much